Hi there, my name is George Sharp and I'm a petroleum reservoir engineer. This short video teaches you everything you need to know to do my job. Don't tell the boss, but it's really not that complicated. But that's the point, most things aren't. Engineers use their common sense to solve most problems and use their knowledge in one area to better understand another. So let's take a look at some simple analogies that explain the math and the physics behind a hydrocarbon reservoir. The goal isn't to teach you to become a petroleum engineer, but to teach you how to start thinking like an engineer. An oil reservoir, it turns out, is just like a huge big gulp of soda pop that you buy at the movies. Before you empty your wallet for your tub of sugary goodness, let's do some calculations to verify how much soda pop you're really getting. In the fifth grade, we learned that volume equals height times area. So we can measure the height and area on our big gulp and verify that we have a one gallon container. But their marketing trickery doesn't fool us. We know that doesn't mean we get a gallon of pot because the ice takes up space and some of the ice has melted, adding water to the equation. The space between the ice is called pore space. Porosity is defined as the percent of the total volume that is pore space. Our big gulp may have 50% porosity, while a typical sandstone has porosity from 8 up to 20%, and a shale reservoir may have porosity from 3 to 8%. That doesn't sound like much, but a 100 foot thick sand or shale that covers miles and miles can hold a lot of oil. As I said, a portion of the pore space is filled with soda pop and a portion with water. The volume of pore space that is filled up with pop instead of water is called the pop saturation. So we multiply the porosity and the saturation into the volumetric equation to calculate our true pop volume. An oil reservoir is quite similar to a big gulp. Sandstone rock is like crushed ice that has melted slightly and has then been stuck back in the freezer. When you pull the ice out of the freezer, it seems like a single solid hunk, but the crushed ice is just frozen together at the contact points, leaving significant pore space in between. Similarly, the sandstone reservoir started out as sediments deposited in an ancient ocean where the salt in the ocean precipitated out over eons of time and cemented the sand together at the contact points, leaving pore space in between. Initially, the pore space is completely filled with ancient seawater, but as the carbon matter contained in the shales cooked into oil and gas, it migrated into the sandstones, displacing most of but not all of the seawater that originally occupied the pores. In the end, it turns out we are getting less than half a gallon of pop, but we figure that will last us at least through intermission, so we buy it and drill a well, sticking a straw into our reservoir. When we first pop the top on the reservoir, the CO2 that is dissolved in the pop comes out as a gas and creates pressure that pushes the pop out of the straw. Crude oil has the same reservoir energy in the form of dissolved methane and ethane, which when given the chance, convert to the gas phase and push the oil up the wellbore. However, as that pressure quickly dissipates, pot no longer comes out of the straw and oil no longer comes to the surface in our well. So we have to add energy to the system. For our pot, that energy is us sucking on the straw. For our oil reservoir, that energy comes from a pumping unit that pulls the fluid to the surface. Just like pop into our belly, the oil goes into a separator at the surface that separates the oil, gas, and water, sending the water to disposal and putting the oil and gas to work. A natural gas reservoir, on the other hand, acts more like a scuba diving tank than a big gulp, except that the scuba tank doesn't have sand grains or water taking up part of the space. Nonetheless, the math and the physics are still the same. Before we drill a well, or go scuba diving, we really want to make sure there is plenty of air. So we get out our ruler, measure the height and area, and since there is nothing else in our tank but air, multiply that by a 100% porosity and 100% gas saturation and determine that our tank has, say, one cubic foot of air. That doesn't seem like enough, does it? But unlike liquid, gas is a compressible fluid. The tank gauge, which reads full or empty, is really reading pressure. Same as your bike tire. The higher the pressure, the more gas molecules you have crammed in there. So we add a pressure term to our volumetric equation to convert the one cubic foot of reservoir volume into maybe 1,000 cubic foot of surface volume. We think a thousand cubic feet of air will last us a while, so it's time to go scuba diving. When we drill a well into a gas reservoir, or open the valve on our scuba diving tank, gas flows out because the reservoir pressure inside is greater than the pressure outside. The flow rate, or how fast the gas flows out, 
is equal to a whole bunch of stuff times the pressure difference between the inside and the outside of the reservoir. The greater the pressure difference, the higher the flow rate. In fact, if you make the outside pressure greater than the inside pressure, you will push air into the vessel, just like pumping up a bike tire. Because a higher flow rate increases the cash flow from the well, petroleum engineers do everything they can to maximize the stuff term. There's a lot of stuff, so to speak, in that stuff term, like the properties of the reservoir rock, the viscosity or thickness of the fluid, and how efficiently the well is connected to the reservoir. Much of the stuff is beyond our control, but we have two methods which we commonly use to increase the flow rate from the well. First, we drill horizontally instead of vertically to increase our connection to the reservoir. A vertical well drilled through a 100-foot thick sand will have a 100-foot connection, while a 10,000-foot horizontal well will have a 100 times better connection to the reservoir. Second, one of the rock properties that affects the stuff term is called permeability, or the ability for fluid to flow through the rock. Most sandstones and all shales have very low permeability. Therefore, we hydraulically fracture the reservoir, which breaks up the rock, increasing the permeability by thousands of times. The combination of horizontal drilling and multi-stage hydraulic fracturing increases the productivity of well by tens of thousands of times, allowing us to exploit low permeability reservoirs that would otherwise be uneconomic to produce. Once we have drilled and fracked our well, we put it on production. At this point, we start to learn more about our reservoir. If we plot flow rate versus time on one plot, and reservoir pressure versus cumulative production, or how much we have taken out, on another plot, both of those will decline as the pressure depletes and the flow rate diminishes. How fast they decline tells us if the wells are draining a large or small reservoir volume. As an analogy, if you poke a pin in a truck tire and a bike tire, both inflated to 100 psi, for a minute the flow rate will be identical. However, the bike tire will deplete much more quickly over time. Back to our gas reservoir, when we compare the volume drained by a single well, as determined by pressure decline analysis, to the volume of the larger reservoir, determined from the volumetric equation, we are able to calculate how many wells it will take to drain the full reservoir volume. There you have it. All the differential equations I learned in college aside, I really just used four simple common sense tools to understand and predict the future performance of a reservoir. Tool one, the volumetric equation, calculates the total volume of oil or gas in a reservoir. Tool two, the flow equation, predicts how fast the fluid will come out. Tool three, the flow rate versus time plot, and tool four, the reservoir pressure versus cumulative production plot, help us determine the drainage volume of a given well. Yes, boys and girls, most engineering isn't rocket surgery. It's using your brain to understand and solve problems. So stay curious about the world and how it works, and pay attention in those math and science classes. They are like the broccoli and cauliflower of the academic menu. Not everybody likes them, but they sure are good for you. The end. Thank you for watching this video and for taking the time to learn more about oil and gas. Please go to YouTube to find other educational videos I have published on energy. It's certainly a topic worth your time and effort to understand.